Hi guys, welcome to the introduction to Rust tutorial. My name is Tensor. Today we'll be covering concurrency in Rust. So the main building block for concurrent programming is what is called a thread. And there are two main types of threads in programming. The first type is what is called an OS thread, and the second type is what is called a green thread. Now the operating system thread is actually offered by the operating system itself, and a green thread, however, is an abstraction that sits on top of the operating system thread. The languages like Go and Erlang and Elixir use what are called green threads, and this allows them to spawn many more threads than a normal language that only used operating system threads could. For instance, Go may be able to spawn, say, 10 green threads for every operating system thread, and this would scale up based on the power of the computer that you're actually writing on. Rust, however, uses the operating system threads directly, and the reason why is for the sake of having a lower runtime. By lower runtime, of course, I mean a lower amount of code included in each binary after it's compiled. All right, so here we have a fairly basic example. First, we need to bring in the thread namespace here. So from the standard library, we bring in thread. And then in our main function, we create a mutable vector that's empty. And then we iterate from zero to nine, so 10 iterations. And for each iteration, we push a new thread that gets spawned with thread spawn into our vector. And we use this thread spawn method with a move closure inside of it. Now this is very important, this move keyword. And this move closure then prints out the thread number with I embedded in it. So for instance, the first iteration will be thread zero, the second iteration will be thread one, et cetera, all the way up to thread nine. Then we have another for loop here, which will iterate from zero to nine again, and it will print out main thread nine times. All right, so when we run this program, you can see here that we get thread number zero, then we get thread number one, then the main thread runs that for loop, which iterates 10 times, and then we get thread number three, then thread number two, and then thread number five. In total, we had five external threads run and the main thread run, but what happened to the other five external threads? Well, quite simply, even though our for loop here resolved itself, the other five threads never got to print out their thread number, and that's because the main thread actually terminated before they actually were able to do so. So the thread spawn method will return what's called a join handle, which is a known value. When we call the join method, this join method here, on our join handle, it will force the main thread to wait for the thread that's attached to the join handle to finish. We can come in here and we can say for J and C, so we iterate through our vector here, one thread at a time, and then we call J.join on each thread. And what this will do is it will join up each of the threads to our main thread. So it'll force the main thread to wait for all of the other threads to resolve. And you can see here that we get all of the threads back, but they of course spawn in a non-deterministic manner. So we get thread four first, then we have thread zero, then thread three, then eight, then seven, then two, one, five, nine, and six. If we run this again, you'll see that the order will change. So Rust makes no guarantees about the thread order. Thread zero could run last and thread nine could run first. And honestly, in most cases, we don't really care which thread ends up resolving first and which one resolves last. All right, let's consider this example. So we create a V vector with one, two, three in it. Then we create a thread spawn with a move closure in it. And inside of this thread spawn, we have a println function with V inside of it, and then we call handle that join at the end to wait for the actual thread to resolve itself. Now the reason we're considering this example is because we want to talk about the move keyword here. If I remove the move keyword, you'll see that we'll get an error here. And the error is with the closure itself. Now the reason we're getting this error is because the move allows the closure to use the data from one thread to another thread. So essentially we're, we're taking ownership of this main thread's data inside of this closure here. We've mentioned the move keyword before when we talked about closures, and we also mentioned that the move keyword forces the closure to reference data by value rather than by reference. In this way, we can capture values from the environment while starting new threads. However, Rust infers how to capture, in this case, v, and the macro println only needs a reference, so the closure tries to borrow v. When we put in the move keyword here, instead of borrowing v, we're actually taking v and putting it inside of this thread, 
and giving it complete ownership. We use the move keyword to force the closure to take ownership of the value. And when we use the move keyword, we guarantee to Rust that the main thread won't be using the captured value anymore. If I come down here and I make a println statement and I try to interact with V again, it shouldn't work at all. And you'll see here it says use of a moved value. V is being completely removed from our main scope here and being put inside of our enclosure and our thread here. So this concept is pretty important when thinking about some of the more complicated stuff inside of concurrency. So the second main abstraction that Rust uses for concurrency are what are called channels. So you can see here that we're spawning a channel and we're spawning it and we're setting it equal to a destructed tuple here with TX and RX in it. Then we're spawning a thread here with a move closure in it. And inside of it, we're calling this TX value and we're calling a send method on it with an unwrap. And then afterwards, we're calling a println statement which calls this RX method with a receive V method and another unwrap attached to it. So channels are used to pass messages around and a channel is made up of a transmitter, which is this TX and a receiver, which is this RX. The transmitter is the part that sits upstream where we actually push the message in and then the receiver is where the message comes out. Of course, we destruct the tuple that is returned by the channel method and the TX has a send method that takes the value we want to send and returns a result. And that's why we're using this unwrap wrap here. And basically the result will return an error if, for instance, the RX portion goes out of scope or it's been dropped for any reason and we can't actually complete the message sending. The RX portion, on the other hand, has two useful methods. One's called receive V and the other one is called try receive V. Receive V is a blocking method. So it actually will block, in this case, the main thread's execution and wait for the message to be passed through from the TX to the RX. Try I receive V, however, is non-blocking, and we would use it in cases where we don't need an immediate result, and maybe we want to have the thread to continue doing other things while we're waiting for messages. So in this case, we're just using receive V because we want the message immediately because we don't really have the main thread doing something else. This program, in essence, should just return 42, which will then get print out in this println statement. And you can see here, predictably, we get got 42. Another important thing to make note of is that our channel here comes from a namespace called MPSC. Now this stands for multiple producer single consumer and this is a concept that permeates Rust concurrency model. All right so this example has multiple functions. So we have a function called timer which takes in a use size and a sender and then up top we have this constant called num timers which has a 24 value in it. Then we spawn our thread inside timer and we have a println statement which prints out d which is our use size and then we make the thread sleep for d seconds and then we print out again that d was sent and then we send d through our transmitter here with the send method then inside of main we create our channel here with tx in it then we iterate from 0 to 24 and we then call timer on i and tx.clone so we clone the transmitter multiple times and then finally we iterate through our receiver here and we iterate through it uh, 24 times and then we get the messages back from our timer function here. So this basic example follows the multiple producer single consumer idea. Here we have 24 different producers and we only have one consumer so the main function is getting all of the results back from our multiple different threads here. We've run it and you can see here we've got zero setting timer, one setting timer, and then this goes all the way up to six, and then it goes zero cent, then it goes 13 setting timer, eight setting timer, nine setting timer, 10 up to 12, and then it goes seven setting timer, et cetera, and it keeps going, going, and going, till finally hits 23. And then we go zero received, one cent, one received, two cent, two received, and this keeps going all the way up to 23. There's some time between each of the periods when it's being set, when it's being sent, and when it's being received because we've actually actively caused the thread to uh, stop for a moment. And we did that with our uh, duration from seconds method here. All right, so channels are pretty powerful and they're a pretty good way of sending data around from one 
thread to another. However, Rust has a second abstraction that it uses to communicate shared memory inside of its concurrency model, and that is called the mutex, which stands for mutual exclusion. Now basically a mutex only allows one thread to have access to a piece of data at a given time. There are two main roles with the mutexes in Rust. First, the thread that, need, that wants to access the mutex needs to acquire the lock of the mutex, and then once you finish the data, you must unlock the data so that the other threads can then acquire the data. You can kind of think of a mutex sort of like a storage locker where you only have one key but you have multiple persons who have access to it. So each person who wants to gain access to the locker will need to have access to the key. If another person wants to gain access to the locker then they need to go to the person who owns the key, take the key from them, and then go to the locker and open it. Now our mutex also sort of acts like a smart pointer. This is similar to our box pointer or more appropriately the mutex lock method returns a smart pointer called mutex guard which implements the deref and drop so it will automatically let go of the lock when it goes out of scope. Let's take a look at an example of this. We first create a mutex. Now this mutex is embedded in what's called an arc. Arc is an atomically referenced counted type. We need to do this because arcs convert the types into primitive types which are safe to be shared across threads. Essentially we're converting this mutex into a type that sort of acts like a primitive type but it's safe for being shared across multiple threads. Then we're creating a mutable vector here. Then in our for loop we're iterating from 0 to 9 and then we're creating another arc and we're cloning a reference to our C mutex here. Then we're creating our thread here by spawning them. We're using our move closure again. Inside of this we have a mutable value which uh, is assigned to c.lock. Now this is of course our thread gaining the lock control of our mutex. So gaining the value inside of our mutex, in this case zero. We uh, increment that number. So we need to, of course this is a smart pointer, so we need to dereference it when we want to uh, increment it. Then after the thread goes out of scope, remember that the lock gets dropped out, so automatically our uh, value will automatically become unlocked so that the next thread can grab hold of it. Then we want to push our H, so our thread, into our vector here. Then we're going to iterate through our vectors. We're going to call join so that our main thread will stop and wait for all the other threads to resolve. And of course we call unwrap on both this and on our lock function here because the lock function also returns a result here. And you can see that the lock method has a mutex guard in it which is our uh, smart pointer. Finally we're going to print out our result here and this will be a dereft version of C uh, dot lock. So again we need to call lock for our main thread and of course we're going to unwrap it too. So predictably our result is 10. You can just look at it like this. Each thread is spawned, and when it's spawned, it then gains the access to the mutex, increments the mutex by one, then releases its access to the mutex, and then the next thread gains access to the mutex, increments it by one, releases it, and so on and so forth. And then finally, at the end, after all the threads resolve themselves with the join method, our main thread gains access to the mutex and then prints it out. Now if we wanted to see the incrementing actually happening, we could print out the number here. And you'll see here that the threads go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, so now let's look at an example that actually implements both a mutex and a channel. First we have a function called isPrime, and this checks the primality of our numbers. And this is a really, really expensive way of doing so. So what we're doing is we're iterating from 2 all the way to n, and in this case we're starting at 10 million, so we're iterating from 2 all the way to 10 million, and then we're checking for primality with this. Then we have our producer function. This takes in our channel transmitter, which is our sync sender here, and then it returns a thread join handle here. It spawns a thread, and inside of the closure here, it iterates from 100 million all the way to infinity, and while doing so, it sends a message through our transmitter and of course we unwrap that as well because it's a result here. Then we have our worker which takes in an ID of U64, our shared RX which is a mutex for our receiver. So we've actually wrapped our receiver with a mutex and an arc. In here we spawn another set of threads and we loop them over and over again. Now each one will loop over and over again and we have a value N which is mutable and then we are going to match over our RX unlock. So we're going to unlock the actual RX in the thread and then match 
match over it and if we get an OK back then we are going to try to receive the message. If we get the message then we're just going to set it equal to n. Otherwise if we get an error we're just going to pass back a unit type and if we can't match over the lock or for instance if it can't unlock the mutex then we just send back another unit type here as well. By the end n is not equal to zero which it shouldn't be because we should have passed a few messages through here. Then we check if the number itself is prime by passing it up through this is prime function here in which case it'll go through and print out each of the prime numbers. So you see here in our main function we create our sync channel here and in this case with a sync channel we have to set up the amount of memory that we want to put into it. In this case we're putting 1024 buffer memory inside of it. Then we're setting up our arc mutex with rx inside of it. And then we're going to iterate from 1 to 5 and spawn our workers. So we're going to have 5 worker threads and inside of this we pass in i itself. So we start with 1 and then we pass in our shared rx. Then finally we're going to run our producer and we're going to call join so that the main uh, thread will actually wait for all of the other threads to stop and we're going to of course unwrap it. Just a quick note before I run this program, when dealing with really large numbers, you can put underscores here, similar to like putting commas. So every thousands place, you can put an underscore and then another underscore. So in this case, for a 10 million, we've put two underscores here. It's nice to have them just for readability sake. I don't think I ever went over that when we talked about integers though. All right, so let's run this. So as I mentioned before, this is a pretty expensive way of looking for primes. And you can see here that we have worker two found a prime and this says uh, 10 million and 37. Then we have worker one found a prime, which is 39. And it keeps going like this and it will keep going and going and going and iterating over itself and trying to find primes. Every time we get back a message, it will then send back another prime. It's slowly getting more and more primes. And this in theory should continue to iterate until we run out of memory or until Rust just can't parse the numbers anymore. So if the numbers get too big and Rust can't parse them anymore, then it will automatically just kick out of the program. And you can see here, we're already up to a fairly large number. Again, like I said, it's a fairly expensive way of looking for prime numbers. All right, so I'm just going to manually quit out of this. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you disliked it, then downvote it as much as you'd like. Anyway, have a good night.